Okay, good morning. We'll get started. So our last three lectures here are on uh, gait disorders, which um, is really an opportunity to tie together quite a, a lot of information and um, is kind of on a trajectory to um, what things will be like in the second year neuroscience course. And then our last two lectures are on neuroradiology. Uh, um, some of what I'll do, I was just telling a student in the last lecture, um, will, I hope, solidify a little bit of the cortical information from Dr. Patel's lecture. Okay, so anytime uh, you'll get better at this, but in the third and fourth year of medical school, um, you'll see common things like dizziness and headache. Um, and you want to have a framework for evaluating those conditions and not just think, okay, well, look up a book and there are, you know, 300 causes of dizziness or gait disorders. And so this is kind of a, a framework for evaluating patients that are unsteady on their feet. And this is a very common uh, problem. So 60% of people over the age of 80, this is one of the more common neurology consults um, that we get. And so um, the reason for being unsteady on your feet, uh, a lot of this is not neurologic, although neurologic is one of the top causes. So we'll spend most of our time here on the neurologic causes, but then we'll go over a lot of non-neurologic causes. I mean, if any of you have sprained your ankle or something like that. Well, you walk differently because of that. So that's a, that would be a non-neurologic cause of a gait problem. Uh, we'll say a little bit about psychogenic gait disorders. Um, fear of falling is actually quite common uh, in the elderly. Um, we'll talk about that. And then probably our most common diagnosis, um, and actually just last week I saw three patients referred for gait difficulty and they all had multifactorial, meaning it's not just one thing. It's a whole bunch of things coming together that uh, contribute to unsteady gait. Okay, so in terms of the neurology of having normal walking and balance, um, you need to have these six things going for you. Okay, you need to have strength. That's kind of obvious, right? You need to have strength in your legs, the power um, to get up on your feet, so that's going to involve upper and lower motor neurons working together, right? And of course, the lower motor neurons activate muscles through a neuromuscular junction, and then we have the muscles themselves, all right? So uh, evaluating strength then and looking for upper or lower motor neuron findings will be an important part of our evaluation. Okay, we also need to have the systems in the brain uh, that not that talk to lower motor neurons, okay, that's what upper motor neurons do, but these are the circuits in the cerebellar circuitry, basal ganglia circuitry, that communicate with upper motor neurons to facilitate movement. Okay, and so these are the cerebellar circuits, basal ganglia circuits. So if these are affected, then the patient will have an ataxia, if it's a cerebellar syndrome, or something that looks like Parkinson's, if it's a problem with the basal ganglia circuitry, those have a distinctive kind of a clinical picture and definitely affect walking and balance. Okay, we'll go over a little bit vestibular disorders. So um, this involves the inner ear and the eighth nerve and the brainstem centers that are important for uh, communicating that information up to the brain. And so if we have a kind of a vestibular problem, usually a clue there is the patient has vertigo Okay, and just the, you know, the room spinning or the feeling like you're on a boat creates some instability. Sensation, having normal sensation is very important for having good walking or balance, especially proprioceptive information, right? We always need to know where our legs and feet are in space when we're walking. If you don't, then you're going to be unsteady on your feet. So we'll give some examples of those. We rely on vision very much for having normal balance, you're always monitoring where the floor is, and so especially the elderly as they have visual loss, uh, they'll feel unsteady on their feet. Okay, and then I'll explain what this means here when we get to it, but we have these motor programs in the brain, these circuits that um, are responsible for everything we do. We don't think about throughout the day. Uh, it just happens automatically, and there's an important circuit, complex circuit that's laid down for walking and that can be affected in certain conditions. Okay, so let's go through these. First of all, just a reminder, when we get to strength and upper and lower motor neurons, 
just one of the most important things that uh, you need to take away from this course is the difference between upper and lower motor neuron findings. So let's just review one more time. Um, of course, in anything upper motor neuron, we're going to have hyperreflexia. We'll look for an extensor plantar response or a Babinski sign. Remember that if we have an upper motor neuron problem, the tone is increased, and we call it a spastic weakness. It's stiff. Remember, it's velocity dependent. So if you're moving the arm or the leg in someone that has an upper motor neuron problem, there's a catch to it. Okay, increased tone. Atrophy, fibrillations, and fic uh, fasciculations are not part of upper motor neuron conditions. Okay, by contrast, in a lower motor neuron condition, uh, patient loses reflexes, we're not going to get a Babinski sign, the tone is loose and floppy. Okay, so we call that a flaccid weakness. And we have something lower motor neuron, we have quite profound atrophy that's early, and we see fibrillations and fasciculations. Fasciculations, remember, is what you can see on the skin, a little rippling of the muscle. We've all had fasciculations. Um, but when they're associated with weakness, now we know it's a lower motor neuron kind of a problem. Fib fibrillations we'll talk about next year. Um, that's only something we see on a test called an EMG, where you put a needle in the muscle. Okay, but that's for next year. All right, so we'll just give you some of the most common causes in this uh, strength category. All right, so first let's talk about upper motor neuron conditions. The term myelopathy refers to uh, some disease of the spinal cord. Okay, and so uh, next year we'll go through lots of things that can affect the spinal cord, but one of the most common is a disc herniation that compresses the cord. And that will give the patient a myelopathy. Okay, what's in the spinal cord? Well, remember you've got all of these upper motor neuron pathways that are traveling uh, through the spinal cord. So if you've got a disc pushing on the cord, you tend to get swelling in the cord, and it disrupts these descending upper motor neuron pathways. And so spastic weakness is kind of the hallmark finding of cord compression. So the weakness and the spasticity is going to be below the level of the lesion. So if you've got a disc pushing on C5, then all the muscles below C5 um, will be weak, and there'll be spasticity. So the weakness and spasticity is below the level of the lesion. Okay, but remember, at the level of the lesion, you've got these nerve roots coming out, right? Those are lower motor neurons coming from anterior horn cells. So right at the level of the lesion, and this is often what can help to you to specify and say, ah, oh, it's C5 or C7, is that you'll have focal weakness and lower motor neuron findings of those nerve roots that are coming out, right, where the mass, uh, such as a disc, um, is involved. All right, um, now, any time we involve bilateral upper motor neuron pathways, that tends to give us a narrow-based gait, sometimes called a scissored gait. Okay, so if you see a patient walking on a narrow base where the feet are literally scissoring over, that's bilateral upper motor neuron, and cord compression would be, um, or something involved in the spinal cord, it's probably the most common cause of that type of gait. So narrow base gait should always make us think spinal cord. Okay, so here's the spinal cord, and so if we have a disc uh, or something herniated here, we can have swelling throughout the cord. But remember here are the nerve roots exiting. So only right at the level of the lesion will you get the, the focal uh, root problem. Okay, so here's a disc protrusion. We can see that's going to involve nerve roots. Okay, this is kind of low down. We're looking at the cauda equina here, but uh, if we were higher up, we, this disc could easily um, here compress the spinal cord as well. So this is a very common cause of gait instability, myelopathy. All right, so patients walk on a narrow base, just from a bird's eye view. You have a patient walk in like this, uh, that's what you should be thinking of. Okay, and so if you've localized to the spinal cord, well, we need to image the spinal cord. So here's an MRI. Um, I'll show you this um, on Thursday. 
Okay, but here's a nice normal spinal cord here. Um, I'll talk about this CSF cushion around the spinal cord, which looks normal uh, here. And now we can see that that's lost. So we've got a disc herniation here, and you've got edema and swelling uh, right there in the cord. Okay, so again, anything that compresses the cord, what tends to happen is you get swelling throughout the spinal cord, and so will involve, uh, like here's the cortical spinal tract. Okay, remember you've got the medial motor system here, so you've got other upper motor neurons uh, that can be involved also. Question? I thought I heard someone say question. Yes? So for the radicular findings, would you also have sensory loss? Yeah, so you'd have focal weakness. Let's say it's C5. So your C5 muscles like deltoids and biceps would be affected, but you'd also have numbness in a C5 dermatome like down the lateral arm. So often the numbness uh, can help as well, right? Okay, so here is the corticospinal tract, which we showed many times. So remember that if the lesion tends to involve one half of the cord more than the other, then the weakness is going to be a bit more uh, ipsilateral. Okay, if you've got just a complete trans transection or severe lesion of the spinal cord, then the weakness will be on both sides. Okay. So again, if it's more cervical, you're going to get the cortical spinal tract with ipsilateral weakness, but then you'll get some of these nerve roots that are coming out here. And you're right, it won't just be motor. You've got sensory nerve roots here not shown um, on this diagram. Okay, and again, one of the highest yield things from this course I, that I hope you can remember for long term is the brown saccard syndrome. So if one half of the cord is involved more than the other, you just, you have to remember these three pathways, right? So cortical spinal tract is here. So again, the spastic weakness will be ipsilateral. The hyperreflexia will be ipsilateral, right? The posterior columns are right here. So if you get mainly one half of the cord, the loss of vibration and proprioception is ipsilateral, okay? And so the key thing usually with brown saccard is that pain and temperature crosses over when it comes in. And so if we have our lesion right here, the loss of pain and temperature is going to be on the opposite side. Now, if our lesion is up in the brain, which usually occurs with a stroke, and the more stroke someone has, the more likely they are to be unsteady on their feet. But strokes, you know, if you have something in the spinal cord, you can have nice symmetrical uh, involvement because the spinal cord is so small. If you have strokes in the brain, it's always going to be very asymmetrical. And so patients that have strokes tend to have a hemiplegia. So it's mainly one side of the body that's affected. And when the lesion is in the brain, um, the arm and the leg take this unique position. So remember, a flexed arm. And the foot, in particular, is extended and the toes point down. Okay, So patients walk like this with a flexed arm with toes that point down. And so when the patient walks, to avoid tripping over their toes, they have to swing their leg around like this. That's called circumduction. So if someone's walking like that, you know the problem now is not in the spinal cord, it's up in the brain. And so um, these are usually quite obvious. The patients are known to have a stroke, and you can imagine that's going to affect your stability um, if you uh, have to walk like that. Okay, so those are two causes, upper motor neuron causes, common causes of gait instability. Um, now, one condition that is quite unique in neurology because it has very profound upper and lower motor neuron findings together, and we'll talk much more about this condition in the second year, but we'll introduce it now, is amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. Um, your patients will probably know this as Lou Gehrig's disease, okay, after the famous baseball player who had this syndrome. Okay, if we were just making a list of conditions that give you upper and lower motor neuron findings simultaneously, it'd be pretty small. Okay, but this is always our, our hallmark example of that kind of a condition. All right, so the pathway shown here is the cortical spinal tract. Okay, and what happens in ALS is that the upper motor neurons degenerate way up in the motor cortex. 
And so the dashed lines, what they're trying to show you here, is Wallerian degeneration of the cortical spinal tract. Okay, the whole thing just degenerates. And so you get quite profound upper motor neuron findings in ALS. So they have lots of spasticity, hyperreflexia, Babinski sign, all the upper motor neuron things that we just talked about. Okay, but what is so unique about ALS, which um, might better be called just motor neuron disease, that would be a more descriptive term of what it actually is, because all of the motor neurons are affected in ALS, including the lower motor neurons. So here are the anterior horn cells here in the spinal cord. These also degenerate. And so you get Wallerian degeneration through the motor root and the whole peripheral nerve. You get Wallerian degeneration of that as well. And so it's really a double hit on motor neurons, upper motor neurons and lower motor neurons. And that's why weakness is so rapidly progressive in ALS. Okay, you see a patient literally from one month to the next and they're getting weaker. All right, so ALS, you find upper and lower motor neuron findings. So, you know, it may be that one arm has spasticity and hyperreflexia and the other arm is atrophied and you can't get any reflexes. Okay, so it's kind of the combination of that. Um, foot drop is a very common presentation of ALS. So um, patients just come in with a floppy foot. You find some upper and lower motor neuron findings. That would be a typical presentation. So we've said that fasciculations indicate something that is lower motor neuron. And they can be seen with any lower motor neuron lesion, anterior horn cell, root, peripheral nerve. But fasciculations are most classically seen with anterior horn cell disease. So if you see just lots and lots of fasciculations, um, think about something going on with anterior horn cells. Okay, and atrophy is always something that we would see in patients with uh, ALS because of the lower motor neuron involvement. Okay, but other upper and lower motor neurons are affected as well. Remember the cortical bulbar tract, the pathway that's very important for talking and swallowing. Well, that's an upper motor neuron pathway, and that degenerates in ALS. Okay, so that contributes to dysarthria, dysphagia. But the lower motor neurons that are involved in talking and swallowing are also affected. So the hypoglossal nucleus, 12, nucleus ambiguous for 9 and 10. Okay, so again, the muscles involved in talking and swallowing also take a double hit, both upper and lower motor neurons. So that's why the difficulty talking and swallowing is a very early feature typically in ALS and also rapidly progressive. Okay, so this is a devastating condition. Um, tends to be just like the nicest individuals that get ALS. Um, they're, they're just a pleasure to work with in their family and they really, you know, they need a supportive physician that can help them uh, navigate things. But you can see more than half die within two to three years. So it's a rapidly progressive condition. Okay, so let's just go over this one more time. Here's the cortical spinal tract originating up here. So we have degeneration of the neuron and then Wallerian degeneration all the way down. Here is the cortical bulbar tract in this case showing you the connection with the hypoglossal nucleus. So these both degenerate. Okay, that's the upper motor neuron side of things. Okay, but the lower motor neurons here, the anterior horn cells degenerate, so we get lower motor neuron findings in addition. And here is the hypoglossal nucleus. And so we have degeneration there. Now this would be going out to the tongue and so the tongue will often atrophy, the lower motor neuron finding in ALS. Okay, so this really isn't meant to be the lecture on ALS that's next year, but uh, a, an early gait problem is, um, is always pr usually present in ALS. So we're gonna think about that in someone that comes in with an unsteady gait. Um, this is, I believe, the last uh, baseball card of Lou Gehrig, and some neurologists have noted that he appears to have some hand atrophy here, and uh, his batting average dra dropped quite dramatically um, as he was um, developing the early symptoms. So next year we'll go into the more of the pathophysiology, the cause, and treatments in uh, ALS.
Any questions on that before we move on? Okay, now just to give an example of a lower motor neuron condition that'll affect walking, and uh, lumbosacral radiculopathy would be one of the most common causes. So you pinch a nerve, you know, lumbosacral nerve roots, that's gonna cause weakness and sensory loss in the involved leg, and so that's always gonna affect walking and balance. And so from our radiculopathy lecture, now this is a very, very big picture, bird's eye view, that if the L234 nerve roots are involved, Remember, that supplies mainly muscles above the knee. So we're going to have a lot of proximal weakness in the leg. L5 radiculopathies, the classic presentation there is a foot drop because L5 supplies the tibialis anterior that dorsiflexes the foot. Okay. And if you have an S1 radiculopathy, remember that's shooting pain down the back of the leg. And now we're going to have plantar flexion weakness from involvement of uh, gastrocnemius. So all of these will affect walking and balance. Okay, if we follow the nerve down to through the plexus and into the peripheral nerves, um, probably the most common focal neuropathy that will affect walking is a perineal or fibular neuropathy because this is the nerve that supplies, again, the tibialis anterior. So again, another cause of foot drop, okay, and, and foot drop... Um, causes a distinctive walking pattern. Because remember, if your foot is floppy, now you have to lift your leg up high to avoid tripping over your foot. Okay, so this is called a steppage gait because they're lifting their leg up high. Um, so foot drop here, two causes. L5 radiculopathy, perineal neuropathy, and then you have to kind of sort out on your exam uh, which of those uh, is most likely. Okay, we won't say anything about neuromuscular junction, but remember the nerves have to communicate with muscle, and so uh, neuromuscular junction conditions like myasthenia gravis, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and botulism would certainly affect walking. We'll talk about those next year. Okay, and we have two hours on muscle diseases next year, but let me just tell you about one. Uh, it's a quite common cause of gait difficulty in older men, and it's called inclusion body myositis. And this is a quite unique condition because it tends to involve mainly two muscle groups. In the legs, it's the quadriceps. Okay, and if you have significant bilateral quadriceps weakness, what happens then is when you're walking, your legs keep buckling. They just give out. Okay, but what usually is how we think about this condition is that in the upper extremities, the finger flexors are weak. Okay, there's nothing else that does this. So it's just these two muscle groups. So an older man that's falling and you find quadriceps weakness, very important you check the hands, okay, because these patients can straighten their fingers out just fine. There's no problem with extension. But then you turn the hands over and often patients can't even make a fist, right? They just have, are very weak with finger flexion. All right, so this is... Um, a muscle disease we can diagnose. Used to be had to do a muscle biopsy. Now we can just do a blood test, usually to suggest the diagnosis. Um, but it's a unique presentation. Uh, do we know what causes it? Um, there are some genetic factors that uh, put someone at risk, but um, it isn't really known. There may be something environmental, you know, in the mix also. Okay, so that was just an example of motor uh, weakness causes of gait difficulty. Now, moving to the coordination system. So this would involve either basal ganglia or cerebellum. Anything that affects basal ganglia circuitry um, causes someone to look like they have Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease, remember, is degeneration of the dopamine-producing neurons in the substantia nigra. It has a characteristic gait pattern. So the step stride becomes much shorter. The spouse will say they're just not walking as fast. They've slowed down a lot. So it's a shuffled gait. Um, patients have difficulty getting out of chairs. They can't just stand up. They have to push. And especially if they get in a deep sofa, very difficult. Someone needs to pull them to get out of the deep sofa. When you watch someone with Parkinson's disease walk, they don't swing their arms. They just tend to stay down at their side. 
Okay? And they have frequent episodes of gait freezing, where they're walking along, shuffling along, and all of a sudden their feet just lock up and they can't move. And it can be very hard to kind of unglue the feet and you know, begin to walk again. Now, uh, gait difficulty is very important here in Parkinson's is a late feature. Okay, meaning this is not the initial symptom of Parkinson's disease. Or if it is, it should make you rethink your diagnosis. This is something that happens after lots of other symptoms um, have already been noticed. Okay, and so patients that have Parkinson's disease have a lot of rigidity on exam. They have tremor. They have other exam findings that we'll go into, but they eventually will develop some gait findings. Um, now, contrast that with a condition, a big category that we will call Parkinsonism. And when we use the term Parkinsonism, we mean it looks like Parkinson's disease, but it really isn't. Okay, and so there are a lot of these conditions that superficially you might think the patient has Parkinson's disease. Um, but for reasons we'll discuss next year, it's different. And one of the big clues is when we're dealing with Parkinsonism, often gait difficulty in falling is the first symptom. Okay, so if that's the early feature, then go away from Parkinson's disease and we want to move into the bigger category called Parkinsonism. Yes. What does gait difficulty mean? That's just a huge, broad category for any kind of a balance walking problem. Everything we're talking about in this lecture is gait difficulty. Yeah, so well, okay, so you're just looking at a patient and you're saying, boy, they kind of look like they have Parkinson's disease. And I realize you don't know enough about that uh, necessarily to, to be able to tell. But if the, you're asking the patient, how did this begin? And uh, the patient says, yeah, I started falling six months ago. That was the first symptom. But that should be a clue to you. Okay, whatever this is, it's not Parkinson's disease. It's Parkinsonism. If the patient tells you, uh, for example, yeah, I started with a tremor two years ago, and then I had this problem, and then I had that problem, and then I had this problem, and more recently I've had difficulty walking, then that fit would fit better for Parkinson's disease. Yeah. Now, if our problem is rather with the cerebellum and cerebellar circuitry, of course, we're going to have ataxia. Um, and so remember that when you think about the cerebellum, the more midline the lesion is or the process, it's going to affect midline musculature, important for walking. The more lateral in the cerebellar hemispheres the lesion is, the more distal the ataxia is going to be. So it's going to be more finger to nose. And so gait difficulties with cerebellar lesions especially involve the vermis or the anterior lobe of the cerebellum. Remember, a lot of the anterior lobe is the vermis. Okay, and so these patients will have heel to shin ataxia. And so some conditions we talked about in the cerebellar lecture, chronic alcoholism, strokes in the cerebellum, uh, medulloblastoma, remember this childhood tumor that which is midline, so it involves the vermis. So these will all present with uh, gait difficulty and the classic gait problem with any cerebellar lesion is that it's wide based. Remember contrast that with a myelopathy where it's an upper motor neuron condition, that's a narrow base. So if it's wide based you should be thinking cerebellum. So if our lesions out in the cerebellar hemispheres, that af will affect walking, but it predominantly tends to be more of your finger-to-nose kind of an ataxia. Okay, so if someone is walking unsteady and their feet are far apart, um, could be a lot of different things, but classically this would be a cerebellar gait uh, disorder. Right, next category is vestibular. Okay, and vestibular problems can be peripheral or central. Peripheral means the inner ear or the eighth nerve itself, which is part of the peripheral nervous system. Central would be uh, vestibular pathways in the brainstem. Okay, so peripheral vertigo is any problem with the inner ear or the eighth nerve. And one classic feature of peripheral vertigo is that it's incredibly intense. Okay, so. The reason it's very intense is if you've got a problem in your right inner ear, 
what the brain is getting from both inner ears is going to be dramatically different, what it gets in the right ear versus the left ear. There's a dramatic mismatch, and so that creates very intense vertigo. Uh, these are patients in the emergency room that are holding onto the gurney because it's flipping around. They don't want to move because uh, there's so much vertigo. Compare that with lesions that are central in the brain stem. And even though this is more serious, I mean, I'd rather have a problem in my inner ear than in my brain stem, right? But the vestibular pathways as they go up through the brain stem continually cross back and forth, back and forth. So if you have a brain stem lesion, there's less mismatch. And so the vertigo is actually less intense. Okay, so intensity of the vertigo is one uh, distinguishing feature. But if we've got a lesion in the brain stem, well that's going to affect motor pathways, sensory pathways. And so you should have something focal on your exam. Think about lateral medullary syndrome. Okay, those patients have specific sensory loss. They have Horner's syndrome. They have ataxia. Uh, those would all be examples of focal findings. If you have a problem just in your inner ear, well, you're going to have intense vertigo, but you're not going to have focal sensory loss or pupillary changes or weakness. Okay, so focal findings should tell us that this is central um, vertigo. So let's give some examples of that. By far the most common cause of peripheral vertigo is benign uh, paroxysmal positional vertigo. Again, a condition we'll talk about quite a bit next year, but let's give you the kind of the big picture of this condition. So um, what happens is you have these otoconia in the utricle or saccule. And these are like these calcified crystals um, that give a sense of movement, like that feeling you get when you go down in an elevator um, or you accelerate it in a car. Um, th these uh, are important for sensing that type of movement. Uh, in contrast, your semicircular canals tell your brain where your head is in position. So when you move your head around, you're constantly providing that input to the brain. And so what happens in benign positional vertigo is that the, some of these calcium crystals break off, usually from the utricle, and because of gravity, they tend to fall down into the posterior semicircular canal. Okay, and so these otoconia then, as you move your head around, that one semicircular canal is communicating the wrong information to the brain. Brain doesn't know what to do with that mismatch of information that creates the sensation of vertigo. Okay, and so benign positional vertigo tends to be when you're moving your head in the position that would activate that posterior semicircular canal. And so this is usually rolling over in bed, or patients will often say it's in a certain position when they get their head in that position that it brings on the vertigo. Um, so this is very intense vertigo. And kind of the key feature, I think, is the duration of the vertigo. Okay, so we have a lecture on dizziness next year. We'll talk about a different m number of different types of peripheral vertigo. But benign positional vertigo is quite unique because it lasts for seconds. So the patient will roll over in bed and, oh, it's happening. And it'll spin around for a few seconds and then it stops. Very short. Okay, when you, any condition that involves intense vertigo creates usually nausea and vomiting along with it. So patients will sometimes throw up during those brief episodes. And we will talk about next year how to elicit this on examination. And so you may move the patient back into bed, have them roll into the position that brings it on, and they'll, they'll get the vertigo. And you want to look at the eyes during that time because you see nystagmus. Okay, so they have brief attacks of vertigo, but... If you've got those otoconia sitting in the posterior semicircular canal, patients will just say any movement, like walking around, it just seems like things are going up and down. There's some <coughs> sense of movement. So patients with benign positional vertigo do have uh, gait instability as well. Fortunately, this is usually a self-limited condition, and patients um, recover over several months, typically. Um, another cause of peripheral vertigo is our acoustic schwannoma that we've talked about. So remember, this is in the cerebellopontine angle. So it involves cranial nerve 8 early. And so usually the auditory fibers first, so there's some hearing loss, then the vestibular portion of the 8th nerve. And so there will be a sensation of uh, vertigo. And the 7th nerve, because it's right there, can be affected as well. So 
they'll have a lower motor neuron facial weakness, forehead and lower face. And since the cerebellum is right there in the cerebellopontine angle, if the cerebellum does get compressed, they'll have some ipsilateral ataxia. So we tie all those things together and we know the lesion has to be uh, cerebellopontine angle. <coughs> Okay, so remember cranial nerve 7 and 8 right here. That's where the acoustic schwannoma tends to grow and obviously can involve the cerebellum as well. Frequently involve the trigeminal nerve right here and patients will have some uh, facial numbness. <coughs> and there's a MRI scan of a patient with a cerebellopontine angle. Cerebellum here, there's the pons, cranial nerve 7 and 8 exit right there. Okay, in terms of cause of central vertigo, this one you know hopefully quite well already, which is lateral medullary syndrome. Remember the vestibular nuclei <coughs> are right there in the lateral medulla. Okay, so these patients have vertigo from involvement of the vestibular nuclei. Okay, but remember we won't go over everything with lateral medullary syndrome, but just the parts that mainly affect gait uh, instability that if you involve the inferior cerebellar peduncle and the cerebellum, you're gonna have ipsilateral ataxia. That's going to contribute to the walking problem because that leg you know, isn't coordinated as well. <coughs> but again, you shouldn't confuse this with benign positional vertigo, right? Because of the distinct focal findings um, on exam. All right, next category is sensory loss. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, this is when patients have especially loss of proprioception. They don't know where their feet are. They're going to be unsteady. And so anytime we have a severe loss of vibration and proprioception, um, really the first thing that should come to your mind is B12 deficiency. Okay, there's a big differential. But one reason B12 deficiency should first come to mind is because it's so treatable, right? You've got a fixable cause of the patient's problem. So B12 deficiency, we had a case study on, on this uh, this year, uh, predominantly involves the posterior columns of the spinal cord. Okay, so it's really a, a central nervous system demyelination of those pathways. And so patients on exam have a severe loss of vibration proprioception. Okay, no one comes in saying, I can't feel vibration, right? That's an exam finding. But um, they don't know where their feet are in space. So you need your examination then to sort out, yeah, this patient really can't sense where their legs are in space. Peripheral neuropathy would be another cause of a loss of proprioception. Okay, and the hallmark of a peripheral neuropathy, what I should always suggest that, is when the sensory loss is in a stocking glove pattern. Okay, that means that the sensory loss is distal in the feet and it's distal in the hands. Okay, so a stocking glove pattern suggests peripheral neuropathy <coughs> and the peripheral neuropathies that mainly tend to affect walking and balance uh, are when the large myelinated fibers are affected because remember, vibration and proprioception is conveyed by the large myelinated fibers. So neuropathies that affect the myelin here in the peripheral nerves tend to affect walking. Okay, and if, we, if we're involving the motor fibers, then again in a peripheral neuropathy, everything's always distal. So we may have some distal foot weakness, some distal hand weakness in peripheral neuropathy. <coughs> All right, so an important test here, uh, anytime we have someone with gait instability is the Romberg test we've talked about. Romberg test assumes the patient has good strength to stand. <coughs> And so it, it's an assessment of these three parts uh, that are necessary for balance, vision, vestibular, and proprioception. So again, what you do is you have the patient stand up, close their eyes, and if the patient really begins to sway and to fall, and of course you're gonna be there so they don't fall, then it tells you they either have a vestibular problem or a proprioceptive problem. And that's really not difficult to sort out then. If they complain of vertigo and they've got nystagmus, it's a vestibular problem. If they have loss of vibration and proprioception, then of course you're gonna be in this uh, category. <coughs> I think I mentioned during the neuro exam, um, I've had so many patients tell me that come in with gait problems that when they shower and they close their eyes to rinse the shampoo, that's when they fall. They did a Romberg test for you, right? 
So they just helped you narrow down to one of these two big categories for why they're falling. Okay, won't say much about this, but any cause of visual loss will affect walking and balance. So um, in the elderly, cataracts, macular degeneration. Um, again, if you don't know really where the floor is, um, you're going to be uh, not as steady on your feet. Neurologic causes uh, would be, for example, optic neuritis. Remember, multiple sclerosis. Um, you get demyelination of the optic nerve, and so that would be a cause of visual loss. And so as an important part of the evaluation for someone who comes in saying they're unsteady on their feet, you want to check a visual acuity, you want to look in their eyes. You know, do they have cataracts? Uh, you want to check their visual fields. <coughs> All right, now this category, frontal lobe motor programs. Um, we have an amazing number of circuits that get laid down in our brains to do every activity of life, everything you've done this morning, from you know, showering to eating breakfast to walking here, um, you know, doing your hair, putting on makeup, taking notes. These are all motor programs in your brain so that we do these things automatically and you don't need to, you know, they're just on kind of autopilot. And so there's a motor program in your brain for walking, okay? And so if we have a problem with these motor programs, um, that leads to what we call apraxia. Okay, apraxia then is a failure in the execution of a learned motor task, but it's not describing weakness or a problem with the basal ganglia or cerebellum. You know, the patient, it's not that they can't do it because they can't feel the, the limb. It's a loss of these motor programs. Okay, and so... Uh, just the other day I was driving in and I saw a woman who was doing something on her phone. She was doing Starbucks and she was doing her makeup all at the same time. These are all motor programs that she was using simultaneously and driving, which was uh, the least used you know, part at the moment. But uh, anyway, these are all... Uh, uh, and so patients that have this de 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 uh, kind of a, a loss of these motor programs, the normal tasks of life, they're just clumsy doing. And so uh, patients with apraxia have difficulty just dressing, especially like a patient with Alzheimer's disease where the whole brain tends to degenerate a little bit. And so they lose all these motor programs, all the things we, we take for granted. And so what we'll do on exam in someone with an apraxia, if we think that's what they might have, we'll ask them to mimic several things. Show me how you would brush your teeth. Pretend you have a toothbrush in your hand show me how you'd brush your teeth. Well, we could do that pretty easily, but they just don't know, how, how would I do that? How do I, mip, how do I hold it? Show me how you'd use a pencil. And um, they've lost the ability just to do that naturally. So um, any dementia condition, but Alzheimer's is most common cause of dementia, will cause an apraxia. So they get up on their feet, and again, they just don't know what do I do with my legs almost. It's like very clumsily, we'll put one foot in front of the other. So. This is something that would be in more an advanced dementia uh, where you get this gait apraxia. Okay, I have a neurologist colleague who told me he has a parking apraxia, a parallel parking apraxia, <laughs> and I reminded him that you know, this has to be a learned motor program. <laughs> you, know, you needed to have been able to do it at one point in your life. So. Okay, now this condition I, I bring up reluctantly um, because I want you to think of normal pressure hydrocephalus as a rare condition that you'll probably never see in your medical career, but unfortunately you will, you will see it on every neuroscience board exam you take, step one, two, and three. Okay, so common board exam question, greatly overdiagnosed condition, but it is a cause of a gait apraxia. Okay, normal pressure hydrocephalus has about the most non-specific triad that we could come up with. They have a gait problem, they have dementia, and they have urinary incontinence, which every patient with Alzheimer's disease will have that triad. Um, one clue might be that in normal pressure hydrocephalus, the gait apraxia is an early uh, feature. Remember, it's a late feature in uh, Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so what happens? Well, the problem is probably 
the, the, something happens in the arachnoid granulations to set this off. There's some decreased reabsorption, and they get a communicating hydrocephalus. Maybe at one time there was increased pressure, but the pressure goes back down to normal, but the patients are left with large ventricles. Okay, and so the ventricles push against the descending midline pathways. Remember, what is midline? Paracentral lobule. That's for the leg and the bladder. Okay, so that's why they have a walking problem and a urinary incontinence. Why is it overdiagnosed? Well, a couple of reasons. Very nonspecific triad would be one. Um, the other is, remember that with aging, and especially if we have some dementia, the ventricles get large from atrophy of surrounding tissue. That's hydrocephalus ex vacuo. Okay, so it gets overdiagnosed because, you know, someone in their 80s gets a CT scan for some reason, and the ventricles are large, could be normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is how it comes up all the time um, clinically. And almost always we say, nope, it's hydrocephalus ex vacuo, not normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, so you've got the ventricles that are enlarged here, and so the descending pathways here for the leg and for the bladder that come from the paracentral lobule, they have to loop around the lateral ventricles like this. Okay, and so that's why the legs and uh, the um, bowel and bladder function is affected in normal pressure hydrocephalus. Okay, so here would be kind of a normal looking CT at this level. We'll, we'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, here's hydrocephalus ex vacuo, big ventricles, right? But look at all the atrophy out here. Um, and maybe you haven't looked at enough scans to you know, be able to appreciate this, but the sylvian fissure is really large, abnormally large. This is from atrophy. Okay, these sulci back here are really large. That's atrophy. So this is not normal pressure hydrocephalus. Um, so true normal pressure hydrocephalus, you'd have big ventricles like we see here, but really no peripheral atrophy at all. Okay, so this maybe would make us believers if we saw something like this in the scan. Okay, so we'll get more into normal pressure hydrocephalus um, in the second year, but um, again, it, it always shows up on a board exam, so make sure you know about it, but kind of have that little insight that, well, they really shouldn't be asking me this question because it's so rare. All right, now non-neurologic causes. Um, these are very common. So if you have arthritis in the elderly, you know, get arthritis, that's going to affect walking. Um, anything musculoskeletal, orthopedic, hip pathology, foot, ankle problems is going to affect walking. Okay, if patients, when they stand up, their blood pressure drops. That's called orthostatic hypotension. They're going to feel dizzy, may sometimes pass out when they stand up. That's going to cause falling, okay, but that, that wouldn't be usually a neurologic problem. Any confused encephalopathic patient. So think of someone intoxicated. You know, they're going to be slurring their words, they're going to be confused, and they're also going to be staggering around when they try to walk. Okay, low back pain, hip, knee, ankle problems, again, kind of fits into this musculoskeletal orthopedic category. Um, if you have a cardiorespiratory problem, like congestive heart failure, uh, these patients start to walk and then they get out of breath. And believe it or not, I've seen several of these patients referred for gait problem, and it was just really cardiac. They are just very short of breath. That, that was why they couldn't walk. Okay, psychogenic gait disorders are surprisingly common, okay, where um, the patient comes in with a gait problem, and it's just very bizarre and unusual, and psychogenic gait disorders usually have what we call non-genuine findings on exam. Um, we could call it fake findings, but that's not a very nice um, term. So we say non-physiologic or non-genuine. Uh, and so um, you would look for evidence of significant psych psychiatric disease or a conversion reaction, which is kind of a response to internal stress, sometimes malingering. Okay? And so there are lots of different gait patterns that are psychogenic. So lurching erratically from side to side, going from one wall back to the other wall, back and forth, which actually they often exhibit a lot of quite good coordination doing that. Okay, <laughs> Staggering side to side, the old term for this is astasia, abasia, which to a neurologist usually indicates a psychogenic gait pattern. 
Um, I saw a patient once who came in and uh, I asked, what are you here for? And she said, I have astasia abasia. And another neurologist had diagnosed that and she didn't realize that that meant a psychogenic, you know, kind of a gait um, problem. Um, and often inconsistent findings. So again, we can, if we really like to, if we have a window over a parking lot, we like to see how the patient walks out to their car. And it's often a lot different than what you might see in the office. So there are num lots of different psychogenic gait patterns. Walking on ice, okay, you know how you walk on ice, right? You're going to shuffle your feet forward like this. That's not how someone with Parkinson's walks. That's a, a psychogenic gait pattern. Uh, a quasimodo gait, which would be where a patient says they can't move their leg and they just drag their leg along like this, their weak leg. Uh, there's, there's no neurologic gait that does that. So that would be psychogenic. Or if a patient has a buckling of the legs, they keep going down like this, but they never fall, uh, that also suggests uh, psychogenic. Okay, let me just uh, finish with this one here. Fear of falling is quite common in the elderly. And so what happens is an uh, elderly individual falls, has a really bad experience, and the fear of falling is so intense. I'll get to you in just a minute. I see you back there. The fear of falling is so intense that the fear of falling is actually the biggest contributing factor to their ongoing gait problem, all right? So they're so unsteady walking around carefully because they don't want to uh, fall again. And so these patients often need physical therapy and rehab and, you know, to get some confidence that they can actually walk on their feet. Yes? Well, what do you tell them? That depends on the diagnosis, really. So um, if someone has a conversion reaction, so this is, uh, you know, horrible experience, patients under a lot of stress, um, those patients, if you, you reassure them and tell them, we think you're going to recover really well from this, we'll give you some physical therapy, uh, they say, oh, that's wonderful, thank you, doctor, and they do get better. Uh, if you have a malingering patient, um, they're almost always going to get upset with you when you tell them that you know their neurologic exam looks good, you don't find any explanation for their gait problem. Uh, the response of the patient to receiving that news can actually help you figure out which of these categories you know, you're dealing with. So I don't remember, I don't want to repeat stories, but I did see a patient years ago who came in in a wheelchair, was in a wheelchair basketball league, and had all these fake findings on exam. This didn't make sense. And um, he got upset with me and uh, his physical therapist called me like a year later to say she was in um, Laguna and saw him hop out of his Corvette at the spaghetti factory. And so we, we found out later he'd sued another company over a car accident. And that would be malingering when someone is consciously, you know, doing this for secondary gain. Yes. Well, malingering is the patient is consciously aware, I am doing this because of lawsuits, or there could be lots of other reasons, and in this case it was lawsuit, but yeah, that, that would be, we could say, faking it, you know, in that case. And I wish we had a lecture to go over all the things we could do on exam to figure out whether someone is being genuine or, or non-genuine with this. Okay, so let's stop there, and uh, we'll pick up tomorrow with neuroradiology.